Good morning, MCBC. Hope all of you are doing well today. Let's get ready for some announcements. Tribes are meeting on Zoom. Tonight we have the youth group meeting, and Mondays is Hank Shimmons group, Wednesdays is Bob Berry's group, and Thursdays is Mike Blake's group, and Fridays we have the Postons and the Schmitz. We also have been using Zoom for Sunday school, so check your email for times and meeting information. This June, we have Children's Promotion Sunday on June 7th, and the Marriage Retreat is this summer on June 26th through 27th. Also this summer, we have VBS, which is July 12th through the 16th, and later on we have Youth Camp, which is scheduled for August 4th through the 8th. So I hope you have an awesome Sunday, and let's get ready for some church. All right, Maple City Baptist Church, are we ready? Let's pray. Jesus, be glorified this morning in every living room, where everybody's at. I pray that we can sing together. I pray we can hear the word together, and it'll make an impact. So be glorified today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, something different this week. I need you up off your couch. Everybody off the couch. Set your coffee down, let your kids run around the living room, and let's all sing together. Are you ready? Here we go. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name.
Good morning, everyone. Pastor Mike Blake will be bringing the message to us here shortly. But before that, I have an announcement to make, and that is the month of May is Pastor Appreciation Month for Maple City Baptist Church. You know, over in the book of John, chapter 10, it talks about how Jesus is the good shepherd. You know, his sheep hear his voice, they know him, and they follow him. And uh, our pastors, they're an example of Jesus Christ in that respect. You know, they invest in us, they know us, they get into our lives, and they allow us to get into their lives. And so, Mike and Bo, we just want you to know that we love you, we appreciate you, we thank you for all that you do, but more importantly, for who you are. And it's because of who you are in Jesus Christ that you do what you do. So, thank you for your investment in us. We also know it takes sacrifice on the parts of your wives and your daughters. So Jessica has a few things she'd like to say to them. Becky and Carrie, Proverbs 31:30 says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So I just want to thank you for being an example of women who fear the Lord. Thank you for your investment in me and encouragement over the last couple of years. Girls, Bethany, Josie, Becca, or Mabecca, as known in our house, and Mariah, uh, we love you and thank you for sacrificing time with your dad um, so they can invest and minister to the church body. So we love you. And before I end this message, um, I just want to recognize Bob Barry. Uh, Bob does not have the title of pastor in our church, um, but Bob has certainly been a shepherd to me over the last couple of years. So, Bob, um, when, when I first preached, uh, not long after we moved here, uh, we went, we did that together. And there's not too many times that I haven't gone and preached or taught that you haven't been with me. So we've been uh, in the trenches together. We've prayed together. And we've uh, had some, some, some deep conversations, some personal conversations. And you've certainly been a shepherd in my life. So, uh, Bob, I just want you to know that and, and recognize you publicly. And, and uh, so thank you so much for your investment in me and, and my family as well since we've been here. And uh, we just, we love all of you, Mike, Bo, and uh, Blake family, Green family. We love you guys. We hope you know you're loved. Uh, we hope you're super edified and your hearts are encouraged today. And so we hope you enjoy some more videos from the rest of the church family. Have a great day, everyone. Hey, Mike and Bo. Uh, we just want to say from the Rose that we appreciate the, the example that you guys bring from you and your families uh, to keep it biblical and we just um we know that you try to press on the same path as you are thanks guys for everything you do thank you for continuing to invest in people and in our community and just thank you for your consistent walk with the lord and we love you greens and blakes hi there uh we would just like to express our appreciation for our our two pastors at our church pastor mike and pastor Bo. Um, we just like to thank them for all the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis that um, behind the scenes and, uh, and just keeping us all in line and, and shepherding us. Uh, we're probably not easy sheep to handle sometimes, so we just like to thank you. I just want to say thank you to you both, both families, um, for investing in us and loving us like your own um, family members and um, just uh, seeing the potential we have. And I just... Uh, want to say thank you um, again to the gr just the girls, Carrie and, and Becky and Josie and, and, and Bethany. Um, we love you like your our, um, our family members and um, I don't know what I would do without you ladies. Um, I wouldn't know what to do without Mike and Bo. Um, just having confidence in both of us um, going out and, and sharing Jesus. And so I just am so thankful that we found MCBC. Um, it's our home. We miss everybody. We miss you guys and hope to um, get together real soon. Thank you. Love you. Pastor Appreciation. Hey, we just want to give a big thank you to our pastors, Pastor Mike and Pastor Bo, for all that you guys have done for us over the years, just bringing the word to us. We just want to say a big thank for uh, Pastor Mike for bringing the word to us Sunday morning online since we can't meet. That's a great thing. We can just hear the word still get together. We just want to say thank you, too, to Pastor Bo for getting the kids' stuff going online and getting the packets and everything ready to go. Just want a big shout-out to you and just want to say we're praying for you and your families at this time. And just, again, thank you for all that you do for us all those times. And just um, look forward to seeing everybody again soon. So thank you again to our great pastors. Thank you. All right, good morning, Maple City Baptist Church. 
Um, let me give some reminders this morning before we get into our message. You know, every church is supposed to have a vision. The Bible says without vision, you know, people will perish. We need to know what the church is about. What's the main mission of the church? And there's several verses, several passages in the Bible that show this. Sometimes I like to use John chapter 14 in verse 6, which just says Jesus Christ says he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And so these three things, this is... If you've been in this church for even just several months, you would know this because we say this quite a bit, but we need to be reminded. Don't forget that Jesus Christ said he's the way. You know, people are born um, onto this planet in sin. The Bible says that ever since Adam sinned, man is born in sin. And so basically men are born lost. So the bottom line is they need to know the way. Well, the way is not a church. It's not an organization. The way is a person. Jesus Christ said he is the what? The way. So it's Jesus, right? But I'll tell you what we'll do is practically, this would be evangelism. Evangelism. We share our faith. Jesus is the way. People need to know the way. Well, the next thing he says, Jesus Christ says he's the way, the truth, and the life. Well, John 17, 17 says... Basically, he says t about his disciples as he's praying for them, he just said, sanctify them through thy truth. And he says, thy word is truth. Truth is the Bible, it's the word. So check this out. This would be discipleship. This is where we teach people the word. So our church is about evangelism, people getting saved. Then we need to see them mature. Jesus is the way, the truth, and he's the life. You know, it should lead people to a spot where they grow, and then they want to do ministry. Or the Bible sometimes would use the word missions. That's what we're supposed to be about. So when people get saved and meet Jesus, then they learn the truth, the Bible. We're huge on discipleship. That's what should separate our church from other churches, is we make disciples. And then Jesus says he's the life. It's life-changing. It'll transform your life. So you are now... Different people used to look at you and pray for you because you were like um, a mission field to people. Well, once you meet Jesus and grow, then you become the missionary. It literally changes your life. So this is what our church is about. I just wanted to put this out there and remind everybody um, once again that we're about the way, the truth, and the life. Um, you know, when we disciple men and women, we, we basically have four goals of discipleship that we see in the Bible. And it's important for me to bring these up again this morning because sometimes we lose sight of the goals and what it's really all about. Now, we do have a set of lessons that we use to help, some tools to help get people in the Bible. But really, if there is four goals of discipleship, the very first one is, is going to be that we want to establish people, we want to get people... Get them in the Word. This is the key to get people in the Bible. We want to establish them in God's Word. And this book, matter of fact, the church is called in Timothy, the pillar and ground of truth of the Word of God. So we've got to ground people in the Bible. All through the New Testament, this is said over and over again. The Apostle Paul says, we got to get after and get people in the Word. So our first goal of discipleship, first goal when somebody gets saved in our church is we want them to get in the Bible. And so, hey church, are you in the Bible? You should be in the Bible every day. The second thing is we want to teach people and we want to get them praying. We teach people how to pray. That's the one question the disciples asked Jesus as Lord teach us um, how to pray. Very important. The Bible says we should pray without ceasing. The Bible says that we should have a time where we go into a closet by ourselves and get alone with God and pray. We should pray for all men, Paul tells Timothy. This is what we do. We learn to communicate with God. So God speaks to us. This is how we speak to him. So the second goal of discipleship, of being a follower of Christ, is we teach people to pray. So church, are you praying? 
It's a tough one. It's easier for me to read the Word than to do this. It's a tough discipline um, because I feel like I'm doing nothing. But you know, what's nice about prayer is that's when God gets to work. Because that's when we say, boy, we can't do it. God, we really need you, right? So the third goal of discipleship is to establish people. We get them into a local church or basically we, we get them friends. Or we use the old word fellowship, right? As, or, or, or friendship. We establish people in the church. That's what we do. So they have a friend based. Now our church, um, we have what we call like small groups. We call them tribes in our church. And this is important because people need to know how to behave themselves in the church. First Timothy 3.15 says, the house of God, right? And so it's the only way to grow is to get people in the church. So I know you can be saved without going to church, but you can't grow without being in, involved in a church. You know, even in Hebrews 10, 25, I think that was the Apostle Paul that said, um, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And everybody wants to make that like, oh, one little meeting on Sunday morning. No, I think an assembling or a gathering together. If you look at the church at the beginning of the book of Acts, they had friendships. They were a tribe of people. and They interwove. They did life together. And this is something, uh, you know, that I think some of us are lacking. And not just because of quarantine. We were lacking it before we were locked down into our homes. We don't have friends where we truly fellowship and talk, pray together, and get in the Word together. So that's our third goal of discipleship, is get people in the local church connected deeply in friendships. And then the fourth goal of discipleship is we want to get people really established, but we want to get them in ministry. We get them involved. You know, that way they're, they're always, they're doers of the word, right? It takes all of us. And we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. It is our responsibility and it's our job. So just keep in mind these four goals of discipleship. And some of us out of our church, we've been through a set of lessons, but we're slacking a little bit. So I just wanted to remind you this morning, don't get in the word. Hey, and if you've not been in the word this week, guess what? The Holy Spirit's convicting your heart. Confess it right now to him and do a turnaround, do a change. Get them into prayer. Pray. Make a prayer list. Uh, call somebody else up in the church. Download an app, whatever it takes to help all of us be able to pray. The third goal of discipleship is to get them into the local church, which are tribes, friendships. And we have, a, we have a, a quite a handful of people that would claim this to be their church, and yet they have no deep-rooted relationships here. Let's change that. And then the last thing is to get them in ministry. We want to get them involved in missions, right? So that's what the Maple City Baptist Church, man, that's, we want to be a New Testament thriving, growing, multiplying church. I remember years ago, I read a book um, by Rick Warren. I really liked it. It's called The Purpose Driven Church. And he kind of used the analogy of like a, a baseball diamond, right? You got your bases here on the corner. You got home plate. So first base, um, I always say it's first base, but we call them M words. And this is where we want people to meet Jesus. That's the, how we start this journey, right? Get on first base. And then... The second one, second base would be the other M word, meet Jesus, is we find a place where we belong, or we become members of the church. We get them connected with people. So as people meet Jesus, then our goal is to, for them to become part of our group. And then, of course, M3, third base, is going to be um, maturity. Maturity. We want them to grow. We want them to grow. Then ultimately, the fourth step for this of our church would be, um, you know, it'd be ministry. Or, you know, missions. So just re remember this. 
I don't care if the bases are loaded. The next three guys strike out, guess what? It don't count. So just remember, as people meet Christ, we've got to get them to where they belong here. we got good friendships, good relationships. Then what? We begin to disciple them so people can get established, can be mature. Remember, we just talked about those four goals. And then to get them home, you know what this is? Here's the win right here. This is where we score, is when we get people involved in ministry, people involved in missions. So church, just wanted to give a little bit of a vision reminder of we've got to be after it. Even in the midst of quarantine, no excuses. We have to be the church, the church that God has expected you and me to be, right? Okay, let me erase this and we're going to get after it. Remember the series we're doing has been called Gospelize. The word gospel in the Bible means good news. So it's our goal to share um, good news with people. And that good news is what? The gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 is the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Good news is not... <gasps> Did you hear that they're going to lift the quarantine? Did you hear businesses are going to... Did you hear restaurants are going to be... Okay, fine. That can, that can make us happy. But that's not the good news that's going to change the world. The good news that's going to change the world is Jesus. It's his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what it is. Here we go. Acts chapter 9. We're going to check out a story where Peter comes on the scene. And when Peter comes on the scene, he heals a paralyzed man... And then he also, uh, there's a woman that dies, and he raises her from the dead. So both kind of pictures, they can picture salvation, especially the paralyzed man. But let's dive into this a little bit. Look at Acts 9.32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwelt at Lydda and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. So let's stop there and let's pray. Jesus, teach us your word today. Um, light us up. Keep us inspired and fired up um, to gospelize, to share the good news. Thanks for the story in Acts 9 of Peter. May we take it, make great application to our own lives. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Notice it says in verse 33, I mean, Peter's passing through these quarters, but it says, and there he found a certain man. I want to kind of key on this word found. So he goes to be with the saints there, but all of a sudden he found or he like discovers um, a certain man there, and this man was not complete and whole. This man could not walk. You know, basically, we find what we're seeking for. It, it's, it's just the truth. Um, matter of fact, I, I like this because it says Peter found a certain man, and it reminds me of Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. This is where Jesus Christ, it says, the Son of Man came to what? Seek and to save the lost. So we see already that Jesus set a great example. Um, as Peter's going around, he finds this guy. Well, man, Jesus was seeking and saving the lost. So Peter was going down there with the believers, and all of a sudden, he found a certain man. That's right. And guess what? You, we will all find those certain people in our lives if we're just looking. There's broken and people not whole all around us. Matthew 20 uh, and verse 28, Jesus said, He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus did. In Matthew 18, you know what Jesus did? He left the 99 to save the one that was lost. So basically, he was seeking, he was looking to find. And that's what we've seen that Peter, he found a certain man. They're all around us. Some of us don't have anybody. We have no fruit in our life. No broken people made whole. And I'm telling you, I think this could be part of it. We're not looking. It's right there in front of us. You know, another example of this in the, in the Bible, of course, Jesus. 
But in Matthew 13, 45, there's a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Basically, a businessman or a money man. You know why businessman and some people we'd call them money men? Because that's what they're looking for. They're always looking to make money. And so they do that. And it reminds me of our brothers in Belize. They go diving down for clams and they find these conchs in the Caribbean Sea. But what they're really looking for, yeah, they're valuable. You can sell them on the market and people will buy those and for food. But the best thing of all is, is if you can find a pearl inside of it. Because see, a conch and some of these clams, they can help feed a family. But if you can find pearls, they'll help establish a family. You can actually build a home off of those things. They can provide quite a bit of an income. So that's why Matthew 13, 45 says there was a merchant man, yeah, a businessman seeking pearls just like those guys. See, what you're seeking, you will find. Eventually, you'll find these things. And also, let me give you um, another example of this in the Bible um, and it's found in 1 Peter 5, 8. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it says the devil walking around like a roaring lion. It says seeking whom he may devour. So the devil is walking around and he is seeking. He is, see he is seeking to find whom he can devour. See, he is seeking to find. This is the end result because you know you're going to find, right? Jesus did it. He was looking for lost people, people to minister to. Business people will do it for money. And then we see the devil doing it for what? Destruction to destroy lives. And remember, uh, even when Jesus was born, it says the enemy, well, it calls it the devil in Revelation, but Matthew 2, even Herod. Herod sought to what? Destroy the young child. He was trying to to destroy Jesus Christ. And so in the New Testament, we are commanded to not seek our own prophet, 1 Corinthians 10.33, but the prophet of other people, to seek things above, eternal things. So as we live our life, we should be looking, seeking for what lost people, just like Peter. It says he was with the believers, going down there to meet with the believers, and then he found a certain man. As me and you are living life, what we look for is what we find. And some of us, even, man, I've been caught up in this mess. If you're caught up and, and you're seeking and constantly thinking and desiring lustful things, that's what you're going to find. That's exactly what we're going to find. So here, though, he found a certain man. Our good examples of this are here. If the devil is seeking to find people to destroy them, then you and me, our job is really intensified. We need to be seeking to save people and to rescue them, right? Right. Look what it says here in verse 33. And there he found a certain man. And this man, it says, he had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. Sick of the palsy. Oh, you know another verse I thought of where Jesus says, um, Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. See, what we seek, what we seek is what we find. So if we're really seeking and looking and desiring for people to get saved, we're, we're going to find that, right? And just like the devil, he's looking to devour people, and he's finding them. He's tearing people's lives up, just like businessmen. They're desiring, seeking money, and guess what they do? They do it till they find it. We needed to do it till we find souls, right? So that was some pretty good preaching there. Okay, sorry. I'll go back to where I'm supposed to be. It says the certain man that he found, it says, kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. So eight years. You know, palsy, he basically, Hebrews 12, 12, it says he was feeble in his knees. His limbs were weak. This is who this guy was. And so he kept his bed. So eight years, man, this guy was bound to a bed, man. He, he could not walk. And so it says he was kept his bed and he was sick of the palsy. Now, what happens is when Peter meets him, look what Peter says in verse 34. Peter said unto him, um, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. So beautiful story. Let me key in on something here. I want, I want to key in on this little section where basically it says 
he had kept his bed. And that's what he did. He kept his bed. Well, you and me, this guy couldn't get up. He was stuck to his bed. You know when people get real sick, they can't get out of bed. They'll be in there so long, they'll get bed sores, right? But we have a problem because basically um, we're in a position just like this guy where without Jesus Christ, man, we are just not going to make it. But I just want to point out a few things that, that, that basically when he said Jesus can make you whole, and then the next thing you know he says, arise and make thy bed. See, something had to change. And I, that's why I kind of want to point out, I want you to see it. So he kept his bed. That's what he did for eight years. That's what he did. You know, sin and sickness, um, sickness and unhealthiness and all these handicaps, they really are a result of sin, right? And we're born in sin. And they all come out in different ways. So here he is, you know, living his life, but he kept his bed. I mean, this guy is lame. He's got the palsy. I mean, he, he can't even really move real well. And so when Jesus comes into the picture, it says in verse 34, Jesus, um, he said, Jesus Christ make it the whole arise. And then he says, make thy bed. Do you see the difference? Make thy bed. In one spot, this is what he's doing. He, he keeps his bed. And then once Jesus enters the picture, right? The difference here is going to be Jesus comes in. And then all of a sudden he can arise and he can make his bed. This is where he lived. He kept his bed. And now you know what he's saying? Arise. Now make your bed. Make it, because you're not going to be in here the rest of the day. A bed is supposed to be a place that we just go to for a little sleep at nighttime. It ended up being his whole life. He was stuck to this thing. And so I like it here, because he just says, Hey, guy, he says, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Jesus maketh thee whole. That's what Jesus does. That word maketh and whole is actually they're the same word. In, uh, in Greek. And both of them, he maketh whole, or basically it says that Jesus is the healer. Jesus can heal you. So a lot of people that we run into, they're going to have problems. We can't solve them. But Jesus can. And that's how we see all these examples in the book of Acts. We see somebody that they're not walking correctly, or, or they're not doing life well. Um, we, we see death all around us. Jesus can breathe life into that, right? Um, Matter of fact, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5, in Mark 6, 5, Jesus goes into a town. They struggled believing him, and it just says, As Jesus could do no mighty work there, just except heal a few sick folks. I love the way it words that. Because healing to you and me, it's a mighty work. We have doctors that spend their whole lives being educated to figure out how, how they can bring some healing to people's lives and to some comfort to people. Here it says, Ed, Jesus couldn't do no mighty work. Ed, just accept to heal a few sick folks. See, this is common for him. It's easy for him. That's why we got to point people to Jesus. This world's problems and people's difficulties, I'm telling you right now, for you and me, I don't know. But Jesus, he knows. He can heal. That's what all through the Gospels it says that. There's people that have servants that Jesus, if you just say the word, and the, Jesus said the word and went to that hour, his servant was healed in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus just don't heal people with bad legs. He just don't give the blind the sight, right? You know what the Bible says? Jesus heals the brokenhearted, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. A lot of people look perfectly normal and beautiful, but on the inside, they're dying of a broken heart. Yeah, there's brokenness there. That's where Jesus comes to play, right? And so, and I don't know what your ailment or what it was that was carrying you, but you know, here, this guy kept his bed, and now he don't have to keep it. That's not where he has to stay. Now he can get up and make his bed and get on with the purpose. Get on living life, right? It's, it's just, it's true. Now he can make his bed. Now he's furnished for some great works for the Lord. See, practically, this guy kept his bed his whole life. That's what he did. Probably asked for money and had to beg. He kept his bed. Eight years, he, he couldn't even get up on his own. But once Jesus enters in, he shouldn't be keeping his bed anymore. 
That's why some of us that have some bad habits in our life, you know, some of you haven't changed at all. There's been no real repentance and change. You need it. You're different now. You don't have to keep the same old Jew up. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now this guy can make his bed and move on. See, Jesus rose from the dead, but he asked you, me, me and you to be responsible to make our bed. Get up in the morning and live with the purpose. Don't keep your bed. Keep the same old Jew. Do you know sleep in the Bible? Sleep is a, represents sometimes death. But sleep represents, like in Proverbs, of lazy people. Lazy. God doesn't sleep or slumber. Amen? God don't do that. But Proverbs 6 says, How long will you sleep, old sluggard? It calls you a sluggard. You're a slacker. Poverty's going to come upon you. It's a picture of laziness. It's a picture of the, the farmer that says, Oh, man, yeah, I'm not going to go out and harvest. You know, uh, it's too cold outside. Right now, it's planting season. So some people are like... You, in between rains, they got to plant, and some people won't go out at all. They just assume it's too wet. They don't want the trouble or difficulty. You know what the Bible says to that guy in Proverbs 20 and verse 4? Then you'll be a beggar in harvest time because you didn't do the work. And so you'll be begging in harvest. So guess what, Christians? I think the message today is we gospelize. We need to see people that were keeping their bed. Once they meet Jesus, they make their bed. They live with a purpose. This is why we make disciples. So for some of us, some of us are just plumb lazy. Get up and make your bed. Have you ever heard that, uh, that thing that went viral, that naval, naval Admiral William McRaven? He says this about making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It'll give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. He says, by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that little things in life matter. And I just, I really like that. I think it's super sweet. For you and me as Christians, you know what we need to do? Simply, yeah, we're not the person we used to be. Jesus has entered into our world. And now, guess what? I just want to encourage you this morning. Make your bed. A lot of people don't make your bed. And, and really, a lot of people don't do that type of stuff. And, and yet, you'll find the most accomplished people on the planet. You know what they do? Everyone, they get up and simply, they make their bed. They got things to do. And so that's a place for sleep. It looked all sloppy or comfort. It's not time to be comfy anymore. It's not time to sit around and relax. You get up, straighten your sheets, fold your comfort over, tuck your pillow, and that's one of the first things that we should do. And so this dude with the palsy, guess what he was known for? He was known for his bed, and now he says, you know what? Don't keep it. That's not the place you're going to dwell. Make your bed. It's time. The first things we do in the morning are super important. So he, he was told to arise. Then he said, arise and, hey, make your bed. And it says he arose immediately, immediately did this. So it just makes me think, too, of the first things in the morning are so important. And I, I guess I just want you to know that even repentance in the Bible, you know, God went first. Jesus Christ is the first fruits among many brethren. And he first loved us. See, God went first. And so I just want to encourage everybody this morning with this first concept of like making your bed and move on is this. G go to God first with your problems. That's what we do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Don't seek physicians. Seek him first. Even in our giving. We're you know the principle of giving. Everyone wants to talk about 10%. Skip 10%. It's the first fruits. Give him first. That's what we should do. Matter of fact, that's why you're hearing this message on what? Sunday morning, the first day of the week in Acts chapter 20. Once the, the law was fulfilled, the Sabbath day, all that fulfilled on the resurrection day, the first day of the week, that's when the disciples started gathering. I mean, the whole principle here is this. The whole principle is first, 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 first. And so a guy who was selfish and had the palsy, he kept his bed and he was stuck there. Once Jesus entered the equation, you know what now? Guess what first you're going to do, pal? Make your bed. Fold that rascal up. It's time to what? get on your feet. And it says he did that immediately. It's a great picture of a changed life. So I encourage you this morning. Make your bed. What is that for you? I don't know. It's going to be different for different people. What's the habits and things that held you up in your past? You just kept your bed. It had you stuck. 
Th this is like being shackled. It's like, what was the prison bars you were behind? And now, you know, you do with that, make your bed, fold that stuff up and move on. You've got a purpose now. You've been called like the Apostle Paul. That's what he said in the book of Galatians. He goes, man, he saved me to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him. We're supposed to be gospelizing. And some of us can't gospelize and give good news because we're crying tears, laying in our bed. Make your bed. Make your bed arise and get up, right? Just like uh, that naval admiral said, get up and accomplish something. The very first thing, get it accomplished. Here's a beautiful part of this story, and I'll end on this for, for today in verse um, 35. It says, and all that dwelt at Lydda and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. People took notice of this. People are going to take notice. Now all of a sudden the guy who was stuck and shackled is now very much accomplished. He's going to have a walk with Jesus. He made that bed folded up. People see him walking, and it turned people to the Lord. See, if we gospelize like Peter did, if you give the good news to people, he found a certain man. If we would be seeking people like this and we would find him, guess what? People take notice of that. The greatest and the biggest and the sexiest billboards for the church are change lives. We need people with changed lives all around us. And so let's be like Peter this week. Let's go out, let's seek, and let's start searching. And we will find certain people, and let's meet them right where they're at. And the very people that were shackled, he was shackled to his bed. Now his bed just became a resting place. It's time to get to work. There's no more laziness. No, no laziness. Let's get up and let's get after it. It's time to gospelize Maple City Baptist. It's time. It's time. Let's do that and let's give God our best. Let's give him first. Thank you.